What is happening, guys? UFC 300, it is finally going to be taking place this weekend, and I'll be breaking it down with everything you need to know to make some money playing on DraftKings this week. If you can do me a favor as you're watching this video, like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're not already subscribed, and also a giveaway to talk about. Last week, we did whichever fighter scores the most fantasy points. I would pick one person who got the answer right to give them a free subscription to Odd Chopper, our betting site. The winner was Sam Vice 2563. He guessed Brendan Allen. A few people guessed Brendan Allen, but Sam Vice was the winner once I randomized. I threw all the names into a randomizer and then I uh, picked out one person who got the answer, right? So Brendan Allen, who outscored Ignacio Bahamundes by about one and a half fantasy points, he was the highest scorer last week. Sam Vice got the answer, right? So Sam, hit me up on Twitter and I'll shoot you over a link to get you a free subscription to Odd Shopper. As for a giveaway this week, here's what it's going to be. Let me know in the comment section which fight you think is going to win fight of the night. There are a lot of really good choices. This card top to bottom is going to be filled with bangers. So uh, let me know which fight do you think wins fight of the night. Pick one of those people who gets the answer correct randomly, and I'll give you a free Odd Shopper subscription. If a bunch of people get the answer right, I'll pick multiple people since this is a cool card in UFC 300. One other thing I want to let you guys know about is we also have a promo going on. Since it is UFC 300, the promo code is 300. And here's the deal. You can sign up for any MMA package at stochastic.com using the links that we have below. And if you sign up with the promo code 300, you get 30% off any package you want to sign up for. This deal is going to be ending on Saturday. So if you want to sign up Friday or Saturday, you have to take advantage of it. The deal is not going to be around next week. So take advantage, sign up with that link that we have below. And you get access to, if you're signing up for the Sims package, you get access to our contest generators. You could build all your lineups on our site. And then your Sims as well. So you could simulate all the lineups that are built out in the contest generator. But let's start breaking down the fights. I've been looking forward to this for, I don't know, like three months now or something like that since they started announcing the card. So let's begin with the main event here where we have Alex Pereira taking on Jamal Hill. And I know that 99.9% .9 of you guys are watching this already know this, but three title fights on the card, three fights that are going to be five rounds. Alex Pereira against Jamal Hill for the light heavyweight title. We've got Zhang Wiley against Yan Zhao Nan. That is going to be for the women's strawweight title. And then Justin Gaethje against Max Holloway for the BMF belt. So all three of those fights are going to be five rounds. And that is also going to drive a lot of ownership to those three fights, starting here with Pereira taking on Jamal Hill. And here's where this matchup is a little bit tricky for me. I'm lower on both Pereira and Hill than the market is. So these are two fighters that I would generally like to try to get off of. But when they're fighting each other in the main event of a five-round fight, it does kind of make it hard to avoid them. So if there was one of the five-round fights that I prioritize the least, it would be this one. But it's still one I'm getting a lot of exposure to. You guys could see on the screen, I've got Jamal Hill in 41% of lineups, Pereira in 55%. Maybe I decide to lower that a little bit come tomorrow, but I think Jamal Hill is going to come out fighting uh, extremely aggressively after the long layoff here. And then something else to consider about this fight as well with some of the uncertainties is Jamal Hill's coming off a torn Achilles. So we have not seen Jamal Hill fight since his championship win over Glover Teixeira. And that was over a year ago at this point, January 21st of 2023. A couple months after that, he ends up tearing his Achilles playing a pickup basketball game. So now we're seeing Jamal Hill coming off a very significant injury. And another thing that also I think has to play a factor in this is not only that he had this significant injury, but he's going to be fighting one of the most devastating leg kickers that we've, never, that we've maybe ever seen in the octagon. Pereira has debilitating calf kicks. And what happens if Pereira lands some calf kicks on Jamal Hill's bad leg? Is he 100%? Has he come back too soon? It's really hard to know. But some of those factors are what has me leaning towards Alex Pereira. Also, I do expect this to be a fight that takes place on the feet. If you look at Alex Pereira for his career, he's only landed one takedown. That came against Israel Adesanya. And then as far as Jamal Hill goes, he has never landed a takedown in his entire career. So I do think this fight takes place on the feet. In the kickboxing match, I'm going to have to favor Alex Pereira because of his kickboxing backer and then also the injury layoff for Jamal Hill. Not writing Jamal Hill off by any means because if you guys see here, I still have Jamal Hill in 41% of my lineups. But my preferred play for people who are only playing one lineup or maybe just people who only want to play one side of the main event, it is going to be Alex Pereira as my preferred player to uh, preferred fighter to be getting to. In the co-main event, we have Zhang Weili taking on Yao Zhao Nan. And this is probably my most confident pick on the entire card outside of Bo Nickel. Because the Bo Nickel-Cody Brundage fight, 
you know, I mean, Bo Nickel's like a minus 10 billion favorite at this point. So outside of Bo Nickel, my most confident pick on the fight, not just as a winner, but also as a DFS scorer, is going to be Zhang Wiley. And the primary reason for that, you guys will see here, she's currently in 85% of my lineups. The primary reason for this is she has such a clear path to victory by wrestling and grappling. If the fight takes place on the feet, it would be competitive. But we have now seen matchups where Zhang Wiley has a pretty significant wrestling and grappling advantage. And we've seen that she is not afraid to go to that department at all. So against Amanda Lemos, Lemos, massive power on the feet. What does what does Zhang Wiley do? She goes, I'm not messing around with her on the feet. I'm going to take her down. And that's what she did. She landed six takedowns, 16 minutes of control time in a 25-minute fight. Just ridiculous kind of numbers there from Zhang Wiley. In her fight against Joanna Yonjacek, she ends up finishing Joanna in the second round. But in the first round, she landed three takedowns, nearly three minutes of control time. Considering this is a game plan we've seen her implement multiple times in recent fights, and it's her most obvious path to victory, I don't see any reason she isn't going to go to the wrestling grappling department. If she decides to stand and trade, it would be a bad decision. We have a 50-50 fight on our hands. But I think there's a lot of evidence that indicates we are going to see Zhang Wiley come out and wrestle. And if she does, she wins. And I think she also puts up a massive DraftKings score. So if you look at not just my exposures, but also our projected fantasy points and our data here at stochastic.com, we have her projected for about 10 more fantasy points than Bo Nickel is the second highest projected scorer on the slate. She's going to be chalk projected for 53% ownership as of now, but still I'm looking to be overweight to Zhang Wiley. She's going to be a core piece of my lineups and be the fighter that I have the most exposure to. Getting back to the other title fights we have on the card, well, the final title fight, Justin Gaethje taking on Max Holloway for the bad motherfucker belt. And I'm leaning towards Max Holloway here. I I'm a little upset that I missed out on the really wide line on Max Holloway. So if you guys were tracking some of the opening betting line here, we had Justin Gaethje open up as a favorite. And then as we got closer and closer to UFC 300, the line was growing. Gaethje was becoming a bigger and bigger favorite to the point that Max was almost a plus 200 underdog. And I understand favoring Gaethje in the fight. I just thought the line was getting out of control way too wide. And I was looking at it a couple days ago. I was really considering betting Max at close to plus 200. And then what happens is I go to bed, I wake up in the morning and Max is plus 135 when I get up in the morning. And then a lot of the value was gone at that point. But I agree with the line movement here. I do think this is a much closer fight than what the initial line indicated. And I also think that Max Holloway is much too cheap on DraftKings. So if you look at my exposures here, and this is going to be an absolute crazy war of a fight. So whoever wins, I think should score extremely well. And uh, considering the price point on Max Holloway, he is my most rostered punt play on the entire slate. He's right now in 57% of my lineups, 37% exposure to me for Justin Gaethje. So still a decent chunk, but less than the 42% we're projecting the field to get to. And that's also a little piece of leverage I like. I do like that we're getting Max Holloway at lower projected ownership than Justin Gaethje in this matchup. But another thing too is, People are reading a lot into Max Holloway's first fight at 155 pounds against Dustin Poirier. I'm not putting all that much stock into the fight. It was one that Holloway took on fairly short notice. He also, because he was still the reigning featherweight champion at the time, he wasn't able to put on the kind of muscle to really allow him to compete at 155 pounds. He basically just fought at his featherweight frame and didn't cut as much weight. Whereas if you look at his preparation for this fight, Max is noticeably bigger. He's put on some size to better have himself prepared to be able to fight in a war at 155 pounds. And I think that's going to pay big dividends for him in this matchup. I think he's going to be more durable. Not that Max isn't already durable. He is arguably the most durable fighter we've ever seen fight in the UFC. But also, I think it's going to help him in the power department. And if you look at some of the numbers here, I mean, Max Holloway landing 7.17 significant strikes for his career. We've got uh, Justin Gaethje on the other side. I'm letting 7.35 significant strikes per minute for his career. Just insane output kind of numbers. That's why I think we should expect this fight to be a war. But I do think it's one that is going to be very competitive with high output on both sides. I give the volume advantage and the speed advantage to Max Holloway. I think the power advantage goes to Justin Gaethje. But I also think Max has a durability advantage where I have seen a lot of people saying they think that Justin Gaethje is going to knock out Max Holloway. And I'm not going to tell you that's impossible. Justin Gaethje is massive power. He could knock out anybody. 
But Max Holloway is the minutes winner in just about every single fight he's in, unless he's fighting the prime version of Alexander Volkanovsky. And that's where I think the case is going to be for this fight as well. I think Max Holloway is going to be the minutes winner, while there is more finishing equity on the Justin Gaethje side. But the reason I'm picking Max Holloway to win is because of the durability of Max Holloway. Look at how many UFC fights he's had and how many wars he's been in over the course of his career. He's never been knocked out once. He's never been knocked down once. So with that being the case, it is really hard for me to go out and say that I think that Justin Gaethje is going to be able to knock down or knock out Max Holloway. So with that in, with that in mind, I'm picking Max Holloway to win. Picking to win either by decision or maybe a late finish. We have seen Justin Gaethje wilt in the later stages of some of his fights, where if you look at the fight, for instance, against, uh, where is it? Yeah, the fight against Dustin Poirier, that one he got finished in the fourth round after winning early rounds, and then also the fight against Daddy Alvarez, where Justin Gaethje looked good in the early going, but then kind of started to fade in the later stages before getting finished in the third round. So in some of these extended wars that Gaethje has been in, we have seen him get hurt and finished in the later stages. That's another possibility, but I'm picking Max to win, and he's a punt option that I really, really like getting to on this card, where it is hard to find cheap options that I'm really liking. Max is one that I like quite a bit. Charles Oliveira against Armand Sarukian. And I do think the betting line is maybe a little bit wide for this fight. The problem I have with Oliveira, though, is he's very content after he's been taken down to just kind of lay in guard, throw up some submissions off his back, and isn't always necessarily proactive to win minutes off of his back. He's certainly dangerous off his back as a grappler. But in his last fight against Benil Dariush, and I get it, it was a spectacular finish by Oliveira. He ended up getting the knockout at the end of the first round. But here's the concern. Benil Dariush ended up getting top position in that fight, and then he held control time for nearly three minutes. If Armand Sarukian gets on top of Charles Oliveira and Oliveira is just content to lay on bottom, he's going to end up losing the fight. And that's something that really does concern me about Oliveira as a live underdog, where if that is what ends up happening in this fight, if he doesn't get a first round finish, even if he ends up, say, like submitting Sarukian from guard in the second round or something like that, you aren't going to get all that great of a score out of Charles Oliveira. So while I do think that there's merit to saying that the betting line is too wide and that Oliveira is too cheap for DraftKings purposes, I do question what the upside is if Oliveira doesn't get a first round finish. And with all of the other payoff options that I'm really liking on the slate, it's hard for me to prioritize. Uh, Sarukian as well. So right now I have Charles Oliveira in, let's see, where's, where's Charles Oliveira? Yeah, I've got Oliveira in 19% of my lineups, Sarukian in 20%. So relative to what we would normally expect from an oliveira Sarukian fight, I can't really prioritize it on this particular card. And those are the tough decisions we have to make for UFC 300 is top to bottom, the card is completely stacked, but we can't just go all in on every single fight. Some fights kind of have to fall by the wayside. So I'm not really prioritizing the Sarukian and Oliveira fight as much as I otherwise would like to. Bo Nickel against Cody Brundage. I don't really have too much to say about this fight. Bo Nickel is an insanely large favorite. Let me see. What are the most recent odds at the time I'm recording? I saw him at minus 3,500 earlier. Let's see. What are some of the consensus lines now on Bo Nickel? It's a massive line. I just want to see if it's still moving. Don't And also... Don't parlay Bo Nickel. Not saying he's not, he's going to win, but you just don't get anything out of adding like a minus billion favorite to your parlay slip. Because if something bizarre happens, like he blows out his knee, has a non contact injury, falls off the stool and hits his head and knocks himself out, then you just lost a bet on a parlay that you weren't going to be getting anything added to in your ticket. But uh, we've got. Yeah, anywhere from, well, the line's actually come down a little bit. Not that it really says anything, but yeah, Bo Nickel around minus 2,000 favorite as of right now. He's going to win this fight. He's going to win the fight however he wants. If he chooses to stand and strike with Cody Brundage, which I don't think he's going to do, I think he knocks out Cody Brundage. If he chooses to wrestle, I think he submits Cody Brundage. Or the other scenario, we've seen this from Cody Brundage in a bunch of his recent fights. He might just come out and pull guard and then end up losing in that way as well. Because Cody Brundage, you saw that in the Cedricus Dumas fight, where Cody Brundage did get two takedowns credited for him, but what happened in that fight for the most part, the rounds would start, Cody Brundage would shoot for a takedown, he wouldn't get it, he would just pull guard, Dumas laid on top of him, and that's how the fight ended. Cody Brundage landed three significant strikes in a 15-minute fight that ended up going to decision. So 
I'm going to pick Bo Nickel to win. He's going to win by whatever method he wants. But just because of the price of Bo Nickel, no surprise, the most expensive fighter on the card at $9,500. With the amount of action fights we have, I think Bo Nickel is very dependent on getting that first 60-second bonus to be in the optimal lineup. And it's hard to bank on that. So Bo Nickel, I'm going to have exposure to him. I'm not going to have exposure to Cody Brundage, but I'm not really prioritizing Bo Nickel. He's only in 20% of my lineups at the moment. Next fight on the card, we've got Yuri Prohaska against Alexander Rakic. And Rakic also coming off a very significant leg injury and a long layoff. One of three fighters on the card that are coming off significant leg injuries. So we have Jamal Hill in the main event that we already talked about coming off a torn Achilles. We have Alexander Rakic coming off a long layoff. He tore his ACL in a fight against Jan Blachowicz. And that was, what was the date? Uh, May 14th of 2022. So we're looking at nearly a two-year layoff for Alexander Rakic since he lost fought, which is uh, certainly a concern for me. And then we've also got Calvin Cater that we're going to be talking about in a little bit. He's also coming off a torn ACL. He tore his ACL in a fight against Brendan Allen. Uh, but I don't know exactly what to make of Rakic coming off the long layoff. I'm going to favor Yuri to win the fight because of the inactivity of Rakic. And I'm also not sure that Rakic could keep up with the volume of Yuri. One thing that Yuri is, is not defensively responsible. So we could certainly see a scenario where Yuri's very aggressive in the early going of the fight and gets himself knocked out. But if the fight gets extended, I don't know that Rakic is going to be able to fight a hard three rounds in the same way we've seen out of Yuri, because Yuri keeps just an insane pace on the feet. We've seen that in the fight against Glover Teixeira, he landed 120 significant strikes. In the fight against Dominic Reyes, he landed 77 significant strikes and finished him in the second round. Against Volkan Uzdemir, he landed 33 significant strikes and finished him right at the beginning of the second round. So, like I said, the, the one concern you always have to have with Yuri is that he can be chinny. He can be hit hard. We just saw him get knocked out by Alex Pereira in his last fight. Potentially a little bit of an early stoppage. It's not like he got knocked out cold or anything like that. Although Yuri himself said he didn't think it was an early stoppage. So the chin is a little bit of a concern, but the long layoff and the durability of the legs for Rakic is also a concern for me. So just because of the fact that I like the output of Yuri, and then as well as he is the fighters fought more recently, I'm going to be picking him to win. And I also like him for DraftKings purposes because Yuri, all of his wins score really well for DK. So I right now have Yuri in 29% of my lineups. And he's also projected for modest ownership. This is a fight that's kind of going overlooked. So uh, only 22% ownership projected to go to Yuri Prohaska. I do like being overweight to him. Uh, Rakic, certainly in play as well. But my preferred side is going to be Yuri Prohaska. Next fight here, Calvin Cater against Aljamain Sterling. Mentioned before, Calvin Cater is one of the three fighters on the card that's coming off a significant injury and a long layoff. We lost saw Cater fight in October 29th of 2022, so about a year and a half layoff for Cater coming off the torn ACL against Arnold Allen. It was a non-contact knee injury. With that said, Arnold Allen did win the first round of that fight. And then on the other side, we've got Aljamain Sterling coming off. Well, not coming off. He's going to be making his debut at featherweight. So he is coming off of a knockout against Sean O'Malley when he lost his bantamweight title. And then after that, we saw Aljo move up to featherweight. That's going to clear the way for Marab to compete for the bantamweight title without having to fight Aljo at any point in time. And I don't think that Aljo has the best style for 145 pounds because so much of what Aljo did to find success at bantamweight was being a very, very dominant grappler, but not a great wrestler. So if you look at the stats here on Aljo, while he does land 1.97 takedowns per 15 minutes, he only has 24% takedown accuracy. We've seen some fights where Aljo has to shoot a massive amount of takedowns in order to land them. So look at the fight, for instance, against Piotr Jan. Right, split decision win for Aljo, but he goes 2 of 22 on takedown attempts. So he'll rinse and repeat and continue to shoot those takedowns. And against smaller opponents at bantamweight, he's able to eventually get those takedowns, but I don't know if he's going to be able to bully fighters in the same way, fighting up 10 pounds. Aljo is going to be a little bit stronger in his own right. And sure, if he wins this fight, could he take down Cater, submit him, and put up a big fantasy score? Sure. I just don't think that's the most likely outcome. So what I think happens is that Calvin Cater keeps his distance, wins the fight by decision, fighting on the outside. Uh, that is one of the bets that I've placed for this card. I have Calvin Cater on the money line. And the best available line right now is plus 147. 
I would bet anything better than like plus 120 on Calvin Cater. And this is a fight that I don't have that much interest in for DraftKings purposes. One of the only fights that I don't think profiles to be like a banger based on what the matchup is. So I'm not getting myself to very much exposure to Cater or Sterling. If I had to pick one side of it, I'm going to go to Cater. I'm picking him to win the fight outright. And he is cheaper, but there are better fights to target on the card. Moving it on down here, we have Holly Holm taking on the UFC debutante and Kayla Harrison. And if you guys have seen Kayla Harrison's body composition right now, she is absolutely shredded for 135 pounds. A lot of people were skeptical about whether she was going to be able to make the weight or not. And there was reason to be skeptical of her making the weight. Kayla Harrison is a judoka U.S. gold medalist at the Olympics. And she fought in the Olympics many years ago at 166 pounds. And now as an older athlete, she's cutting down to 135 pounds. I don't know when the last time she weighed 135 pounds was, but I assume it was probably when she was like in middle school or high school or something like that. So it was a really, really big weight cut for her. But physically, I thought she looked pretty good on the scale. She was ripped. Her arms are massive. She is going to have a big strength advantage over Holly Holm. And that's what I think is going to really matter in this fight is... At some point, Kayla Harrison is going to get her hands on Holly Holm. When she does, she's going to drag Holly Holm to the mat. And then from there, I'm going to be interested to see like how conservative is Kayla Harrison going to be? Is she going to go aggressive for submissions? Is she going to open up with ground and pound? Because at times when we've seen her fight in PFL, she has had, frankly, kind of boring fights where she's gotten takedown, she's held top position, hasn't really done a whole bunch with that. Now, I do think there's a chance with her fighting on UFC 300. And then also, Dana White making the announcement that the bonuses for this card, they're going to be $300,000 as opposed to $50,000. I do think that could lend to some more aggressive fights, fighters going for finishes more often, as well as just some wars on the feet. So maybe that encourages Kayla Harrison to make more of a statement or UFC debut and be more aggressive. But with that said it's hard for me to really prioritize. They're kind of the same thing I mentioned with Bo Nickel before. And same deal, I have Kayla Harrison in 20% of my lineups, the exact same mark I have on Bo Nickel. Now, one thing that at least is a positive about Kayla Harrison, she's going to be very contrarian. People are spending up for everybody other than Kayla Harrison on this card. We have her projected for just 12% ownership. And there is a path where she gets takedowns and scores a really big fantasy score with a first round finish. I just don't think it's the most likely outcome. So for large field tournaments, I'm getting to Kayla Harrison strictly because of how low the ownership is. But if you're somebody who just plays like one, two, three lineups, I would recommend you look elsewhere as opposed to rostering Kayla Harrison. And Holly Holm, I have zero interest in rostering on this fight because even if she wins, which I don't think is going to happen, she's traditionally not a good DraftKings score. And even some of the fights as of late where she has put up decent scores, it's because she's shot for takedowns and she's gotten control time up against the cage or on the mat. And I don't think that's a path for her against Kayla Harrison. So uh, pretty confidently picking Kayla Harrison to win, uh, but for DraftKings purposes, I do prefer to spend up elsewhere. Uh, next fight here, Sadiq Youssef against Diego Lopez. I think this is a sleeper fight for fight of the night. When I did that giveaway before and said that, hey, let me know below who you guys think is going to be the fight of the night and give away free subs to people who get the answer right, I fully expect the most popular answer is going to be Justin Gaethje and Max Holloway, as it should be. There is no way that fight isn't an absolute war. But I kind of feel the same way about this fight because Sadiq Youssef is all forward pressure on the feet, landing Nick nearly six significant strikes per minute. And then Diego Lopez, he's somebody who is just constantly hunting for finishes. He's not the best minutes winner. He's not the best striker. He's a negative striking differential. He's never landed a takedown in the UFC. He has zero takedowns on his record, but he still does have submissions because he's extremely dangerous off his back. So if there's a finish in the fight, I think it's a little bit more likely from the Diego Lopez side. But I do think the winner and the, the minutes winner in this fight is Sadiq Youssef. And on top of that, I think Sadiq Youssef also has finishing equity, more finishing equity than I think the public is letting on because Diego Lopez is so hittable on the feet. He does absorb 4.91 significant strikes per minute. And I do think Youssef also got a great amount of experience in his first UFC main event when he took on Edson Barbosa in his last fight because Youssef looked great in the early going of that fight, but kind of blew his wad in the early going, trying to go for the finish on Barbosa, and then ended up tiring out a little bit in the later stages. So I do think he probably learned better ways to pace himself. And now also he gets to fight three rounds as opposed to five rounds. And based on what the ownership is here, 
I prefer the Yusuf side a little bit. We currently have Sadiq Yusuf projected for 20% ownership, whereas we've got Diego Lopez projected for 24% ownership. And the betting line keeps moving in favor of Lopez. So the more that that gets wide, I do think we're going to see the field go more and more towards Diego Lopez. So I wouldn't be surprised if by the time the card starts tomorrow, Lopez is close to like 30% owned and we get Yusuf at closer to 15%. So I think in the mid-range, that Sadiq Youssef, a pretty interesting contrarian option. I do think whoever wins this fight should put up a big score. And I'm going to be more on the Youssef side, who I'm currently overweight to. Next fight here, Jalen Turner against Hinato Moicano. And we got uh, Money Moicano, who's quickly become one of my favorite fighters and probably a lot of your guys' favorite fighter as well, just because he says some of just the most ridiculous outlandish things when he does interviews afterwards. And he's also just super entertaining. It seems to be a good guy as well. So Hinato Moicano, fan favorite, one of my favorite fighters. But I think this is a brutally terrible matchup for him because one thing we've seen from Moicano at this point in his career, he is now 35 or 34, soon to be 35 years old. He does not take damage all that well. So in Moicano's last fight against Drew Dober, he was getting hurt and rocked with every single punch that landed on the feet against him. And eventually he did end up getting the decision win because Drew Dober, for whatever reason, decided to try to force grappling exchanges against Hanato Moicano. Moicano is just the much better grappler of the two. So Moicano was able to get top position. He was able to burn minutes that way and ended up winning in that fashion. In this fight against Jalen Turner, I think that this fight is likely to take place on the feet. There's a massive reach advantage for Jalen Turner. He is six foot three compared to five foot eleven for Moicano. So he's got a four inch reach advantage and then a five in oh, sorry, five inch reach advantage, four inch height advantage. So when this fight does take place on the feet, I think there's going to not only be just an overall big striking advantage for Jalen Turner in terms of the technique on the feet, but also there's a big power advantage for Jalen Turner. There's a big reach advantage. He's going to be hitting Moicano before Moicano could get in close to him. So I think Jalen Turner knocks out Moicano in this fight. I think he does it in the first round, kind of similar to how his fight went against Bobby Green last time out. If Moicano does win, it's likely to come from wrestling and grappling and put up a big fantasy score. So he's a live underdog, but my preferred side of this fight is for sure Jalen Turner. Pick him to win. Pick him to win by first round KO. And he's a payup option that I'm getting to a pretty good amount of. I have 25% of Jalen Turner. I actually thought I had a little bit more last I'd look. I'm going to give a little bit of an ROI boost to Jalen Turner in the Sims after when I'm uh, submitting the final version of my lineups because I do want to have north of 30% of Jalen Turner when he's projected for ownership, uh, just a little bit over 20%. I think he has some of the highest upside on the card and is also one of the more likely fighters, in my opinion, to potentially win by the uh, quick win bonus. Jessica Andrade against Marina Rodriguez. This is a very close competitive fight. There has been some line movement in favor of Jessica Andrade. This was a pick and now Andrade is anywhere from like a minus 130 to minus 145 favorite at the time that I'm recording. For DFS purposes, though, I have to prefer the Andrade side of the fight because when Andrade wins, it is always really big fantasy scores. Whereas Marina Rodriguez, when she wins, it could be good fantasy scores, But a lot of times she's winning striking-based decisions where if she doesn't get a finish, it's just strikes and there are no takedowns or knockdowns involved in a lot of them. Whereas Jessica Andrade, when she wins, she was landing a lot of takedowns. She's landing with a lot of power. She's knocking fighters down. So the fight against Mackenzie Dern, for instance, Jessica Andrade was a very contrarian option for DraftKings. Jessica Andrade lands four knockdowns and gets herself a second-round finish. Other fights we've seen from her recently against Lauren Murphy. Jessica Andrade wins a decision, but still puts up a big fantasy score because she landed a takedown in 231 significant strikes. Ridiculous output for a 15-minute fight. Against Amanda Lemo, she gets herself a first-round finish. Against Cynthia Calvillo, she gets herself a first-round finish. Against uh, Caitlin Chukagian, she got herself a first-round finish. So a lot of big scores and wins for Jessica Andrade. Usually comes potentially finishes. We've also seen her with a lot of wrestling output. Jessica Andrade lands 2.45 takedowns per 15 minutes. Marina Rodriguez is very, very sketchy takedown defense. So there's a lot of paths for Jessica Andrade to not only win this fight, but also put up, put up a big DraftKings score. So Jessica Andrade is another fighter that I like targeting in the mid-range. She is currently in uh, 23% of my lineups. Another fighter who, this is just the first version of my lineups, but I will also be doing an ROI boost to Jessica Andrade to make sure that she appears in more of my lineups in the final version before I submit them. A couple of fights left to talk about here. Bobby Green against Jim Miller. And as far as this fight goes between Bobby Green and Jim Miller, 
I'm pretty concerned about the turnaround for Bobby Green. His last fight came against the aforementioned Jalen Turner, and this fight came in December. Jalen Turner not only knocked out Bobby Green in the first round, but he knocked him out like 17 times. And it was a fight that should have been stopped way earlier than it was. This is something that is uh, going to be talked about a lot leading up to this fight where Jalen Turner knocks down Bobby Green. Bobby Green, when he gets knocked down, already appears to be unconscious. Jalen Green starts landing ground and pound. Bobby Green wakes back up gets knocked out, wakes back up, gets knocked out, wakes up, gets back, gets knocked out again. And the ref is just standing there, I don't know, figuring out what groceries he needs or something like that. Doesn't step in until there's just a mass amount of unanswered shots that Bobby Green takes while already being unconscious. So I know the stat keeper credited Jalen Green with 30, or sorry, Jalen Turner with 33 significant strikes. It seemed like a lot more than that in real time, counting with 15 ground strikes. And I don't know that that's damage that Bobby Green is going to easily be able to come back from. So with that being the case, I like Jim Miller as a live underdog because Jim Miller has big power, especially in the early goings. And if Bobby Green has come back too soon, keep in mind he just got knocked out brutally and took a ton of damage in December. If this is too quick of a turnaround for him, I think he could be in trouble in the early going against Jim Miller. Whereas if Bobby Green wins, I think it's probably going to be a relatively high volume striking output, but it's probably more likely to be by decision. And then another problem too with Bobby Green at his price point is that there are so many fighters around him that think have higher upside in a win. So uh, I'm actually going to pick Jim Miller to win by finish. It's not the most confident pick in the world, but I am pretty confident that of the two sides of this fight, Jim Miller is the better DraftKings target. Because in a win, I think he's far more likely to be in an optimal lineup than Bobby Green is. And then finally, we've got Davis and Figueredo against Cody Garbrandt. I'm a little bit concerned with Cody Garbrandt for a couple of reasons. Number one, he clearly cannot take damage at this point in his career anymore. He used to be a guy who we would just see get into wars. He would get hit a couple of times, and he would just see red like a bull, and he would just turn his fights into a brawl. And it'd just be, we are going to exchange punches and one of us is going to fall, and it would typically be Cody Garbrandt because he just doesn't have all that great of a chin. And then in recent fights, we've seen Cody Garbrandt be much more conservative, uh, conservative to a point where, honestly, a lot of his fights have been pretty boring. He did get a knockout against Brian Kelleher. The fight against Trevin Jones sucked, though. It was a terrible fight. Cody Garbrandt lands 26, lands 26 significant strikes in a 15-minute decision, and I get worried that with the $300,000 bonus, Cody Garbrandt comes out trying to put on a show and just runs into a big shot from Devis and Figueredo that he's not able to handle. So I'm going to pick Figueredo to win. I'm picking him to win by knockout. But once again, in the interest of there being a lot of high upside fighters to pay up for, I am finding it difficult to get all the way up to Figgy. He's only in 9% of my lineups. I'm prioritizing getting to other favorites on the card. Not because I don't think Figueredo wins. I even think he wins by knockout, but I think it's going to be the case for a lot of the payup options on this slate. So that's a rundown of everything from me. If you guys like this content, do me a favor, like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Don't forget, if you want to sign up for our Sims tool, we get all the access at stochastic.com, access to all the data, have the ability to build your lineups on our site, the ability to simulate out those lineups, sign up using the link below, enter the promo code 300 to get yourself 30% off. And then also, Who's going to be the fight of the night? Let me know below. I'm going to pick at least one of you that gets the answer right to get a free Odd Shopper subscription. If a bunch of people get the answer right, then I'll pick multiple of you guys. So uh, good luck. Hope you guys enjoy the card. This should be one of the most fun UFC events that we've ever seen. I'm really looking forward to it. Hopefully you guys are too. So enjoy the card, and I'll see you back here next week. Peace out.